question, okay? This is your opinion. Who is Jesus? See, now, see, now you won't start trouble. It's a myth created by man in order to control society. I don't, I don't consider Jesus my savior or my spiritual leader. He is a spiritual leader and right. one of the spiritual leaders I learned from. Who is Jesus, in Who your opinion? Who was he? Who was Who he? Who was he? Was a man. He was a man. Okay. Absolutely. Your opinion. Jesus is, in my opinion, yeah. he's everything around here. He's spiritual, everything, earth, water, fire, everything. Jesus is all that's good, all the things that are positive and affirmative in life. Uh, that's Jesus. I believe he's a higher power in the form of a man. Everyone else walking around, there's not another Jesus. There's just one. So yeah, I believe he definitely did something. Oh. Yeah, uh, like on, Jesus like, is not a person. He's not a person, okay? Okay. So do you believe he was a man or just like some higher power or? No, I don't believe in. Don't believe he even no. existed. No. Okay. No. Jesus is um, our savior. Jesus is everything. He's the reason why we live. He's the reason why um, we get to do the things that we do in life. He's my heart and he's what I speak through my poetry, through my work, through my everyday life. That's Jesus. There are many questions that stump people of all ages genders, sizes. Some of the most profound questions have to do with Jesus. And when we, when we hear the answer to some of those questions, I think sometimes, honestly, if, if we are honest with ourselves, our, our, our response would be, really? So the story goes that some 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to the earth as, as God taking on flesh and he, he lived for 30 years before he became a public figure and, and for three years or so he, he went around doing miracles and he did lots of great things and there were times when he had large groups of people following him but at a certain time at about three and a half years into his public life the religious leaders ganged up on him, decided that he had to go, and they trumped up some charges, and they turned him over to the Roman authorities who, who were happy to oblige. Uh, they beat him, they, they abused him, they mocked him, and then they killed him. Then, a short time later, the disciples who had all abandoned him started preaching about him. They started saying, remember all this stuff Jesus did? Well, Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead, and he will never die. And from that group of small, the small group, the 11, and probably about 120 initially, it grew very rapidly to 3,000 and 5,000 more. And and we have millions of Christians across the globe who are part of what Jesus started. The, the movement that he started was the church. And we're here today because we are part of that movement and part of what Jesus did. Over the next three weeks, I want to examine three of the core claims that Jesus made, that Christians make, that the church makes. My purpose in doing this is not to prove. My purpose is to make us think. My purpose is for those of us who say that we're disciples of Jesus, I want to challenge us to think deeply about who he is and what impact that should have on our lives. And as we do that, I want us to wonder for ourselves. Do others see a difference in me. But if you're here and you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to check this Christianity thing out, but I don't buy it yet. You're in the right place. 
because I want to challenge you to think deeply about it. I want to challenge you to encounter Jesus for yourself or to disprove for yourself that he is not who we claim that he is. Because the, the Bible proclaims that Jesus was fully God who came down and became fully man and this God-man died and he rose from the dead. Now the first question that we're going to deal with is of utmost importance because if this one cannot be substantiated then everything else falls apart. The first question that many people will ask will, will respond with, really? Is can Jesus really be God? Can Jesus really be God? Can a man be God? Well, one of the most important figures in the New Testament church, the, we, we come to know him as the Apostle Paul, he, he wrote this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul talks here about Jesus being in the form of God. The word form is the Greek word morphe. And it stresses the inner essence or reality of that which is with which it is, is associated. In other words, what he's saying here in plain language that they would have understood when they read it was that Jesus is completely God. Not mixing any, any, any metaphors, not, not leaving any, any room for doubt. So here's the thing we have to confront, be confronted with. As a follower of Jesus, the Bible says he was God. You'll see in these next three weeks that, that Jesus is going to be backed into a corner. He is either completely God and he's completely man. He really died and he really rose from the dead or all of it is a myth. So if you're claiming to be a disciple of Jesus, you better be sure that what you believe is true. And that's what I want us to do. Now some claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. That he never said, I am God. So I recently asked somebody what they thought of Jesus and, and here's, here were their words. I think he was a good moral teacher, possibly even a prophet, but I would never put it on him or anyone else that they are God. The only problem we have with that is that Jesus himself claimed to be God. Now, if, if somebody makes a claim that isn't true, what do we call them? And if somebody makes a claim that they really think is true, but it's not true, what do we call them? Deranged. You're really quick on the answers over there. <laughs> and, but, if somebody makes a claim that is true, even though it's outrageous, what do we call them? We might call them God. We might. So Jesus claims to be God. He's not ambiguous. In John 10, chapter 10, and verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one, okay? Um, now, to us, we could probably explain this lots of different ways. What in the world did he mean there? And you could read different commentaries on this, and there are some who don't accept that the Bible is truly divinely inspired and truly God's word. They don't accept that Jesus is the Son of God, and they'll come up with lots of different descriptions and, and ways to do um, exegetical gymnastics to get around Jesus' claim here. So, really, remember a few weeks ago I told you that the exegetes cheer is, is three words. Remember what they are? Context, 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 right? Right? So in the context of the people that were there listening to Jesus speak, what did they think he said? What did they think he meant? The Jews picked up stones again. By the way, 
seems to be a habit for them. Picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. They were infuriated. Jesus was a man like them. They could touch him. They could see his breath on a cold day. They knew when he needed to put a little more deodorant on. He was a man. But this man made an outrageous claim. He claimed to be God. And they understood it. A couple of the times Jesus claimed to be God. In John 8, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, you may recall that little phrase. Back in the book of Exodus, when God introduced himself personally to Moses, Moses said, God, you want me to go and talk to your people and tell them that they should follow me and that you're going to lead them out of the promised land? I don't know even who you are. What's your name? And he said, I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you, the eternally existent one. And so when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, they understood what he meant. He was claiming deity. He claimed directly to be God, but not all of his claims were direct claims. Jesus claimed also to be equal with God. Remember the passage we started with in Philippians 2. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, though he was fully God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now remember, they already have, have tried to stone him because he claimed to be equal with God. Because they understood that the claim of equality with God means that you claim that you have all the rights of deity. You claim that you have all the rights of deity. The people of his day understood what it meant. And so, in John 5, My father is working until now, Jesus says, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be equal with God. And then he did some other, even more subtle things to demonstrate his deity. He forgave sins. Forgiving sins is something only God can do. Now, if someone sins against you, you can forgive them, right? But if someone sins against somebody else, you have no right to forgive them of their sins. That's not within your authority. But there's an incident where four really good friends take their buddy and they put him on some sort of pallet and they carry him to meet with Jesus. But they can't get in. It's too big a crowd. These guys are not to be deterred they somehow climb to the roof of this house with this guy still on the pallet. Can you imagine what that must have been like for that guy? Wait, there's a seatbelt! They haul him up. They start pulling tiles off the roof. Now imagine, Jesus is probably in the middle of the room. People are all around him. People are hanging out the windows. People are peering in from outside. And the dirt, the dust, the debris the muck and all the stuff that's normally up on the flat roof of that time is falling down on Jesus. And they lower this guy through. Had to be a pretty big hole. And when they do that, Jesus says to them, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I imagine as the dust and stuff started falling, people were, were making noise. They were, what in the world, wiping this stuff 
stuff off. You know, I got my good toga on. You know, all that stuff, right? And all eyes are on Jesus. The dust is settling. It's deathly quiet. And Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, Every once in a while when we have a sound issue and we get a really loud noise, we, we all jump, right? I think that when Jesus said that, especially the religious people in the, in the room jumped. They're like, what did he just say? What, what did he just say? Some of the teachers of the, of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking like this? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? Well, answer it for me. For you and me, which is easier? To say, Take up your mat and walk, or your sins are forgiven? Well, we can say those words, but can you forgive somebody's sins? No. That's ridiculous. Only God can forgive sin. So Jesus is saying, hey, this is nothing for me. I can tell him, take up his bed and walk, or I can tell him you're forgiven. Either way, same outcome. Because Jesus is saying here that I am God, and you need to be confronted with that reality. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and take your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus wanted them to know. Because they already knew that only God could forgive sins, but he wanted them to know that he was forgiving this guy's sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go. Jesus forgave sins. Jesus raised people from the dead. One of the most well-known stories in the Bible, John chapter 11, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now, in case you're wondering, was he just sleeping, like some people think Jesus was after they took him down off the cross? Lazarus was in the grave for four days. You ever wonder why? Because common thought for the Jew was that after four days their spirit would leave their body and go somewhere else. So he wasn't just mostly dead. <laughs> he was really dead. And they all knew it. Jesus forgave sins. Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus accepted worship. All the way through the Bible whenever an angel a messenger from God would come to God's people and God's people would, would in reverence bow down before that angel. The angel would say, stop it. I'm a servant like you. Only God receives worship. So when Jesus shows up and speaks to his disciples in the upper room, Thomas isn't there. Now, Thomas gets a bad rap. He's doubting Thomas and all that stuff. But I, you know what? I think, I think I'm just like him. and Maybe you are too. Because it, it, it could easily have been, you know, something I imagined because I really wanted it to happen. So Thomas says, you know what? Forget it. Unless I put my hand in his side and my fingers in, in the holes in his, in his wrists and in his feet, I'm not going to believe that, he, that he's alive. So Jesus shows up again. And he, his response is one of utter and complete worship. He falls on his face before Jesus and he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus does not stop him. Not only does he not stop Thomas, but he continues on to commend Thomas and those who would come after him, all of us, who have not had the opportunity to see Jesus' physical body. And yet we believed in him, in, in him anyway. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. He received worship. 
Jesus' disciples understood that Jesus claimed to be God. Not, all, not just the 11, but those that came after, like, for instance, the Apostle Paul. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form in Christ. Philosopher John Paul Sartre shared this cheery insight. Life is an empty bubble on a sea of nothingness. Life is an empty bubble on a sea of nothingness. But because all the fullness of deity lives in Christ in bodily form, verse 9 of Colossians 2 says, verse 10 of Colossians 2 can say this, and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. Because Christ is God in flesh completely, you and I receive the fullness from him in our lives today. He comes in and radically changes us. Speaking of Jesus, the author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 45, which reads, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Pretty clear words. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A couple more clear statements from the former Christ-hater, Christian killer, Saul, later known as Paul. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And now listen to how Jesus is described in the book of Revelation. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. He is Lord of all. Then at the end of the book, I saw heaven and earth, excuse me, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thighs he has written the name, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He is either God, he is either King of Kings and Lord of Lords, or he's a liar, he's deranged, he's a deceiver. He does not give us an option to. After hearing what many people said about who Jesus was from his disciples, he looked them in the eye and he said to them, he asked them this question, who do you say that I am? As we prepare ourselves to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, I think he wants us to each consider that question. Who do you say that he is? When it comes down to it, I could add multiplied scriptures to the ones, the handful that I shared with you today, of Jesus' claims of his deity. I could add to that proofs from his life that he, he behaved in a way that only God could. I could add to that the claims of his disciples, 
hundreds of fulfilled prophecies. I could add to that the greatest evidence of all, the resurrection, which we will look at on Easter Sunday. But in the end, each of us has to decide who do you say that he is? Now, I want to be extremely clear here. Just because you and I get to make a decision doesn't mean that our decision is right. You don't get to choose what truth is. You just get to choose whether or not you'll believe truth or make your own. Who do you say that Jesus is? C.S. Lewis, in a book um, entitled God in the Dock, I would highly recommend this book. It's, it's a book that basically puts God on trial. In the British court system, the place where the defendant was is called the dock. And so in this book, C.S. Lewis puts, God's on tri- puts God on trial, um, and it's, it's uh, quite, a, quite an interesting study. But listen to what he says. Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. Let me ask you an honest question. Is Jesus moderately important to you? Have you settled for $3 worth of God? If he's God, what kind of implication does that have for your life? As we prepare ourselves to celebrate Easter, I have a challenge for us. Two, really. I want to ask every one of us to to kind of put aside, to consider, at least, and if you can't put it aside, add to what you already do in your devotional time. And I want to challenge you to pick one of the Gospels and read the Gospel. Go slow. Take each verse as if it were a morsel of a meal and ask Jesus to become real to you again. To reinvigorate your love relationship with him. We say around here that we are disciples and the disciple is someone who connects with God and with others. We, we love him deeply. We, we, we grow spiritually mature and we engage our culture. Well, this is a time to just focus personally on our connection with him. Choose one of the gospels. I'm going to read John. Pick whichever one you want and take some time. Find whatever time you can each day and just read about Jesus and ask him to become more real to you. If you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, then then I would challenge you to do the same. Take one of the Bibles in the pews. It's our gift to you. And pick one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and read and encounter him, maybe for the first time. If you're interested in going a little more in-depth on the deity of Jesus, um, this was something that was sent to me a while ago. It comes, it's a, an excerpt from uh, the book Christ Before the Manger. I have the book as well if you're interested in reading that. But this is um, all different passages about the deity of Jesus. And there's, there's, there's three pages of it. Um, There's lots of good stuff here, and it's not exhaustive by any stretch. So if you're interested in in having one of these and maybe letting that guide your thoughts this week as well, there's some out on on the information table in the foyer that we made copies of for you, and we would love for you to take that. So encounter him for yourself afresh or for the first time. Second thing, the Sunday after Easter, we're going to to have a kind of a pastor's meet and greet for anybody who wants to come and just have some some cookie and cookies and cake and stuff like that and just talk a little bit get to know each other some and one of the things that I want to do during that time is promote uh, just a two-week seminar that I that I want to do called the resurrection in you and it's a book that we're going to give out on Easter Sunday to everyone who's interested in, 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 in receiving a copy and it'll be an opportunity for us to take a couple of weeks the 20 uh, excuse me the 30th of April and the 7th of May and just talk about the resurrection did it really happen 
are there really any proofs for it? If it's true, why, why did he do it? And what difference does it make? I think sometimes, for me anyway, the Christian calendar events kind of come and go, and they can lose their, their specialness. They can lose their focus. I want to let this one become just more profound for me. And I hope you'll join me on that journey. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for your goodness and your love. Thank you for the gift of your son, who was our great high priest who willingly came and sacrificed himself completely for us. Thank you that, that he made these claims. And Lord, I pray that you'll make clear what truth is and that we will encounter Jesus in a way that maybe we never have before or maybe a way that we've kind of forgotten about and that we will fall more deeply in love with him. We pray that you'll continue working in our midst and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.